book one, from then to now, part fourteen. I sat and watched the ocean, and the sunlight reflection. As I was staring out to sea, I saw something in the water. At first I thought it was a dolphin jumping around. Then it came closer to the shoreline. I could see something under the surface swimming towards me. Almost instantly the head of a person appeared and waved to me. It looked like a girl with her arm in the air. I hesitated for a moment and then decided to wave back. As I was waving, she dove down, and her fin-like tail came to the surface, and then she was gone. I stood up, real fast, and ran to the shoreline, but I could see that she was gone. The next morning came fast. I was up at early dawn. As Mary and Paul were getting up at the same time. Buna steer, Scoldy, another day to live on the dirt, said Paul as he was laughing. Ki paso, Paul, I said as I was trying to wake up. We are going fishing today, youngster. You and I will take the boat out and get fish for ourselves, and some to trade with our friends," he said as he was getting dressed. OK, that sounds like work and fun at the same time. I'm up for it," I said as I got ready to go. Mary was already up and fixed us some rice and beans. I could smell them as I came into the room. I could eat those things every day, I said to her. There is always plenty here for you, Indian boy. We never run out, she said, smiling as she was serving and moving about her kitchen. Paul came into the room and sat down. The Indian and I are fishing today, Mama. The rice and beans will get us going, he said with a loud laughter. We ate and then went down to the shoreline. It is another great day with the sun gleaming on the sea and reflecting the light of reality on this world, I said to Paul as we moved his boat to the water's edge. You are a great light in our lives, Goldie. It is so good to have you here with us, said Paul as he steadied the boat. You are the same to me, Paul, you and Mary, and all those like you. Actually, everyone is the light. They don't realise it yet, but they are on their own journey to the great eagle that is, I said feeling well rested and ready for some hard work. Let's shove off, said Paul as we pushed the boat into the water and then jumped in it. We paddled as fast as we could to get out and over the waves that were coming in. The waves are bigger today. This is the biggest I've seen them in a long time he said, while he was moving his arms as fast as he could to get the boat moving. It took a while to get out, as we finally got through the heavy surf. We rowed to a spot about a kilometre offshore. Paul knew where the fish were usually at. He said that there was a shallow reef under water and there were always thousands of fish to be seen from the surface. When we got to the spot, 
I could see through the water very clearly. There were many schools of different fish everywhere. It was a beautiful sight just to watch them moving through the water so effortlessly. We put our lines into the water and waited. It wasn't long before we began catching the fish. They were so easy to catch. Within a couple of hours, we had part of the boat full of fish. We have Mucho, said Paul. Let's head back to the house. Mary will be so happy to see all the fish. We paddled back and then rowed the surf into the beach. As we were doing so, I thought about the experience of myself in the future and riding the waves on those logs. We were soon on shore and pulling the boat across the sand. It was a lot heavier now. The boat was a lot lighter this morning, I said, trying to make all the effort as fun as possible. It took the rest of the day to get the fish up the bluff and prepared. What a day it was, but it was worth it. We now had enough fish for a lifetime and then some. The cat came down as we were unloading. I'll take my share right now, he said, licking his little teeth. After we were finished, Paul and I sat down in a pair of hammocks he had strung up that were overlooking the bluffs and out across the sea. This is great, Paul. I love the ocean and everything that blends into it. We really did good today. That was fun, I said. Us Mexicans have the best life, he said, as the late afternoon sun was setting into a colourful mixture along the horizon. I find everything to be so amazing, how it all works and provides itself to all of us, I said, just relaxing my really tired body. You have a way with words, Goldie, that is why you will make a great writer, said Paul, as he was swinging back and forth on his hammock. Then Mary came out carrying two big plates. Look what I have, amigos, fish and some old-fashioned rice and beans, con tortillas, she said, giggling as she handed us the plates. This looks great, Mary, mutus gracious, I said as I grabbed the plate and began to eat. This is the life, Senor Goldie, said Paul, and we didn't say another word until we were finished. Mary gave Little Feather some fish, and he said to me, Mutus gracias, Senor Goldie, for catching the fish. I had to laugh at how he communicated with me. I was exhausted after we were through eating. I just lay there and watched the sun disappear into the ocean. Soon the stars were out and the night-time sky came into view with its blanket of dotted lights. There was no lights out here except for the lantern that Mary had near the house, so the evening was very dark and provided a perfect backdrop for all the stars that filled the sky. I lay there looking into the vastness of the sky and wondering what it was like to be way out there with the stars. It must be like on the inner, where you are floating and feeling free from the weight of the world. After a while I fell asleep from the labour of the day. Suddenly I was outside of myself and above the earth. 
It was a good distance up, because I could actually see the curve of the earth. There was a bluish aura around the earth that seemed to cradle it and provide a friendly feeling about the place. Way out here, the idea of the earth is different, in that all that was taking place on this giant ball in space no longer seemed to be very important. What is of importance is the freedom from the body and its restrictions. I felt free and able to move wherever I wanted to. I decided to go further out into space and explore. I was near the moon, so I went to take a look. As I got closer, I could see all the craters that were there. It was an eerie feeling to be so close to it. I wondered about all the craters and how they came to be. I decided to ask Rebus Artars next time I saw him. As I was thinking about the moon, I suddenly heard a voice. It was an interstellar war that took place many centuries ago, and you will be shown some day, said the voice, and that was it. I really thought for a moment about what was just said, and then wondered what could have made such huge impressions. I flew down very close to the surface, and moved across the rugged terrain. It was a cold, grey and lonely place that was not at all inviting. I sped along the surface at a very fast pace. I was soon at the other side, the dark side, and took a look. It was just a dark place. Just as I was about to leave, something caught my attention. There were some lights way up ahead that I could barely see, so I decided to investigate. As I came closer, I could see different types of structures that I have never seen on Earth. I flew around the area and began to realise that it was some kind of mining camp. I could not see anyone anywhere. I figured they must be resting or asleep. They seemed to be digging up a very large portion of the area. What they were doing looked to be pretty dull and uninteresting, so I decided to move past this place and explore some of the other planets. I went further out into space. I had read about some of the planets in books and knew their names. From where I was at, I could see Venus and Mars. I took a closer look at Venus. It was very cloudy, so I went over near Mars. It seemed to be an interesting planet, especially with all the colouring that it had. I went down to take a closer look. I could see there were a lot of canals running in all different directions along the surface. I got very close to get a better view. It was mainly a lot of grey reddish soil that covered almost everything. There were also a lot of rocky areas that stood out all over the place. Just like the moon, it didn't look too friendly. As I was floating above the surface, suddenly something came flying overhead. It was moving at a very fast pace as it passed me. As it swept past, it then stopped very abruptly, a good distance from where I was at. 
It looked like a giant dinner plate. It floated above the surface of the land, and then gently lowered itself into one of the wide canals, and then disappeared. I didn't know what to think about what it could be, but it sure was interesting. For a moment I was a little shocked, and I didn't know what to do. Then I realised that I was safe with the inner body that I was in, and quite possibly whoever it was that was here may not be able to even see me. I floated over to the place that I last saw the big plate vanish. I looked closely at the ground, and I could barely see that there was some type of door that was down in the canal and on the surface. I then remembered what Reba's Artars taught me, and that is that I could go through anything with the real self. I decided to give it a try, and slowly went down through the ground. I soon came out on the other side, into a gigantic opening that was underground. It was rather dimly lit, but easy to see. The area was very large, and inside was a huge city of some sorts. The structures were nothing like on Earth, and they were stacked very high up from the bottom of this place, which seemed to be a long ways down. I could see there were many flying things moving all about. Then the door above me began to open. I moved to the side to see what would happen. It was another flying object that was entering. It swiftly went down into the city, to where it was going, and then out of sight. It was an amazing place, actually rather strange and eerie. I slowly moved closer to one of the taller buildings to see who these people are. As I was floating about, several people came walking out to an outside walkway that leads around the building. I got a good look at them. They were not like the people on Earth at all. Their heads were bigger and egg-shaped, and they had very large eyes. The ones that I saw wore long robes that covered their whole body. I tried to realise what they were saying by listening to them with my real awareness but I could not understand them and the language they were using. It was a fascinating experience, but I soon realised there was nothing here for me here, and so I left. I flew back up through the door and up into the sky, then stopped for a moment, and then flew as fast as I could to the brightest star I could see. I was soon very close to the brightest star. It was a huge ball of fiery light. It was so gigantic and awesome. I slowly moved around it in awe. I suddenly realised that I didn't know where the Earth was at. I knew how to get back though, and that was to imagine myself back in the body. All of a sudden I was back, and still lying in the hammock outside in the dark night. I looked around and saw that Paul was gone. I stayed outside until morning because it was so nice out, and I didn't want to disturb Paul and Mary while they were sleeping. The cat came walking up 
and said that he saw me take off earlier with my inner body. I softly laughed at his remark as he walked off. I was up early and walking around. I was thinking about the planet Mars and what I had seen. It was hard for me to believe what I did see. I knew that if I told anyone, they would consider me to be out of sorts. I wanted to tell Mary and Paul first. I knew that I could trust them, because they were into the adventure of life like me. They were soon up, and I went into the house and sat at the table. Be honest, dear Scoldie, said Mary, as she prepared the rice and beans. Good morning, Mary. I have something very interesting to tell you, I said as Paul came into the room. Hola, amigos, said Paul as he sat down. Little Feather walked into the room and sat next to me. He looked straight at Mary, and then she laughed, because she knew exactly what he wanted. Here you are, Mr. Cat, she said, as she handed him some fish. So, what's new, Goldie? asked Paul. I was thinking about how I was going to tell him what happened and at the same time make it sound fun and interesting. Then I went past all the thinking and said, Do you know there are people on Mars? I waited for their reaction in a funny sort of way, with my mouth tightly closed. They began to laugh as they were preparing their tortillas. You mean those funny-looking creatures that somebody's god made and then got them to live on Mars? said Paul, as he laughed, even louder and almost choked on his tortilla and beans. What? I said. You already know about the Mars people? They both looked at me at the same time and continued to laugh. Rebazar never told you, did he? said Paul, still feeling humorous. There is some form of life on all the planets, but they are not always that obvious. In the future, the Earth people will be dealing with what Rebazar Tars calls aliens. They are on the planet now, and have been here for thousands of years. I have never seen them around here, but I have friends that have travelled to the inland regions and seen strange flying things in the air, and even saw them land on the ground," said Paul. Then the cat said to me, Are you sure you're not seeing things? All of us laughed at that remark. That's what I saw in my experience. There were these machines that flew in the air and looked like the plates we eat on. I went to their underground city and saw where these strange creatures lived, below the surface of the planet. It was well hidden, and I did see it, and it was huge. I never imagined there was life on other planets and more advanced than ours, I said, as the cat kept staring at me oddly. Paul and Mary began to laugh again. Goldie, you are so funny. Life on this planet is not really advanced at all. Most people are still hurting each other over things that don't really matter. Do you know what would happen to the religious orders if people knew there is life on other planets? They would probably have a lot less members than they do now. Their doctrines basically designate that the Earth is their god's pedestal. People on this planet are kept in the dark 
and unaware. The aliens have been here a long time, and they really do not want to have to deal with the humans unless it is necessary, because many humans are too dangerous and ruthless, like wild beasts. It would be like you going out and living in the jungle with all the beasts that could eat you. Of course you wouldn't do it because you would rather be by the beach. There are the good aliens and then there are the bad ones, but our only interest is getting to the real universes, said Paul. How long have you two known about them? I asked. Paul rubbed his chin and began to think. I would say about ten years or so. Mary and I have seen them in the other worlds, but as I said, never on the earth, said Paul. I began to wonder if my experience meant anything. Also, why would they be on the earth, I thought. Do you have an idea why they would be on the earth, Paul? I asked. My guess is that they are exploring the different planets for their own needs, such as their need for different types of minerals. I have met a few people that have seen the flying objects that you are describing. Rebazar Tars has told us there are different races throughout the planetary systems that are far more advanced than anything on the Earth today, or even in the future. He said they are always out exploring, because they have the capability to do so. He said they don't usually make contact with us, because there is no reason to. He told us there are good strangers out there, and there are bad ones, and both kinds visit the earth all the time, but they are best left alone. Rebazar told us what they have to offer is very little compared to the real guides. He also said that in the future many people on earth would become very interested and misled by them again, said Paul. That's so interesting. Rebazar Tars never mentioned them to me at all. I never even imagined there was life on other planets, I said, sitting there in a kind of daze. Goldie, you have enough to do in this lifetime. Trying to figure out why people from other planets are here won't be any benefit to you at all. Besides, who would believe you? You will have the time of your life just getting past the stubborn resistance of the outer attitudes that people have about their own real experiences, let alone trying to tell them about space people, said Paul as he began to laugh. Then the cat looked up at me and said, I don't believe you either. I had to laugh out loud for a moment. You're right, Paul. I think it was the impact of the experience and how different it was that took me by surprise. I know what I have to do, and that is finish my book and then try to see if someone will publish it, I said as I was thinking past what we had just talked about. You will have plenty to do just trying to make that possible, Goldie. You already know that what you are doing is the real way, and it is like nothing else, said Paul as he got up from the table with Mary. We're going to go out and do our chores while you sit here and write and eventually become famous," said Mary, as they strolled outside laughing and holding each other. 
I thought to myself how fortunate I was to know these people and to share their wonderful insights. Little Feather finished his fish and said, I'm going to go and take a nap and have fun with my kitty friends on the other side. Then he jumped down from the chair and went off somewhere 